this is a metaphor for your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like the course keeps changing right before your eyes. Whoa! And in order to maneuver it, you need an expert by your side. That's what Dell Technologies advisors do. They have the tech solutions you need to help you get out in front and stay ahead of the game. Woo! Call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL. I do more with modern devices in Windows 10 Pro. Nervous? Yes. First time. No, I've been nervous lots of times. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're helping you learn true happiness by... What? Okay, this has got to be a typo. Teaching you how to be sad? That's really it? Okay, all right, I'm running with it. Joining us today is happiness expert, also a typo? No, she she does sad too? Uh, okay. Happiness expert, Helen Russell. Plus, in our headline segment, a big radio personality from Tennessee gets into hotter water with timeshares. And later, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to JT, who's wondering about required minimum distributions. What are those? Of course, I'll also save time for my mouth-watering trivia. And now, two guys who are sad mostly when the donuts are gone, it's Joe and oh, j j j j g Because OG ate the last glazed one. Love the glazed donut. No, they're all yours. I get uh, chocolate uh, with um, custard filled. Oh, disgusting. No, actually, delicious. So hey, everybody. Good. Welcome to I Love Donuts, but not Cake Donuts mm, podcast. Donuts. I'm Joe Saul C. Hi, average show money on Twitter. It is donut season, by the way. You and I both originally from Michigan, and this is cider time. By the way, do not try to buy. Yeah, I was going to say, none of that stuff in Texas. Disgusting. Whatever you guys call cider, it's not cider. You just like water down apple juice. Oh, it's so horrible. I remember we first moved here walking in. I'm like, oh, yeah, Albert's oh, selling cider. Cider, yeah, so we, yummy. We poured that crap out. <laughs> it was just stick n- it and drink it, threw it back at him. This Ugh. isn't cider. This is frozen apple juice. Concentrate. You morons. Everybody's like, all right, when we talk money, hey, we're talking a lot of money today. Actually, we're talking about the truth behind getting your goals, because as we've talked about before, OG, so much of your goal setting is around attainment, right? And this, I'm going to get there and everything's going to be great. Well, and then what? Yes. Helen Russell joining us today, expert on happiness and obviously you can't be happy unless you experience sadness. And she's going to teach us how to be sad today, which will make us more happy. Wait, We've what? got that. What? Huh? But uh, we got a great headline <laughs> first. But even before that, do you want to rent your home? <laughs> sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know, it's easy bundling policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing too because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Okay, so did you get the agenda before that? Um, can you repeat the part of this stuff where you said all about the things? I can't do that, but we can go into it, so let's roll. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Investment News, this piece written by Bruce Kelly. We've reported in the past about how Dave Ramsey, the... Do I have to explain who Dave Ramsey is? Uh, no. The belligerent talk show host... Is that what they wrote? That's pretty good. The, no, the dude who frequently loses it. That's just stupid. On people. Uh, no, actually, uh, Dave Ramsey doing a lot of good work for a bunch of people. But we reported in the past, OG, about his problem with one of his uh, advertisers and somebody that he endorsed, which was uh, one of these timeshare exit companies. Uh, yes, I, I recall. Ramsey didn't want to 
have anything to do with that for a bajillion obvious reasons. And uh, the headline here, Dave Ramsey loses deposition fight in timeshare case. State of Washington last year, Bruce writes, sued a former advertiser of Dave Ramsey's broadcast that allegedly used deceptive business practices to get consumers out of timeshare contracts. This month, a state judge in Tennessee, where Ramsey Solutions is based, granted a motion to compel Ramsey's deposition in the matter. Ramsey and his various businesses are not named in the complaint, which was filed February of last year, and alleged that timeshare exit team, which is also known as Reed, Hein and Associates, used numerous unfair or deceptive practice business practices related to services to, quote, exit consumers' timeshares. There's a lot to unpack here. Number one, OG, is the fact that, you know, to some degree, you feel bad for the Ramsey team because a company that uh, that you're affiliated with but don't control runs into trouble and yeah. uh, you're kind of getting dragged into it. That's not good. Yeah, there's obviously a little bit of due diligence there that uh, I bet they wish they would have done a little bit better job on. But but yeah, I mean, to your point, like if you refer somebody, I mean, just kind of dumb that down to a plumber, right? Like you got a plumbing issue, your plumber fixes it, your neighbor has a plumbing issue and you say, oh, you know, I use Jack's plumbing down the street. I got here on time, did the work. I thought it was pretty good. And then he goes over there and drills a hole in his septic tank. You know, like, yeah. now, the, 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 you're, you feel bad. You're like, man, I wish he wouldn't have done that. But, but I didn't, I didn't know that they were going to send the new guy. I didn't know that they were going to do this poorly or, I mean, they did my stuff fine. You know, not that Dave Ramsey probably had a bunch of timeshares he had to get out of. Right. <laughs> Ramsey's like, I got out of all my timeshares. I got them after I paid for them with my credit card points. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a crappy thing. You think they're going after quote unquote going after him because he's the money. Yeah, absolutely. Big name. I'm the AG of Washington. I can get this uh, big personality and involved in this and make, kind of make a name for myself because I took down the big bad. Making a headline is half of it. Yeah. You know, I remember when uh, Spitzer took down Martha Stewart. It was less about what Martha Stewart did and more that he could get Martha Stewart, Martha Stewart's name on all this stuff so he could run for governor. Mm hmm. I mean, that's my take, by the way. And where is Martha Stewart now versus Spitzer? Right, exactly. <laughs> Out of yeah. curiosity, the yeah. 80-year-old Martha Stewart looks like she's 62 and has a gozillion dollars. You know, uh, Ramsey's people do address the issue. He There's a quote in this piece that says, I recall a couple of occasions when I observed a spike in questions or complaints regarding Reed Hine from our listeners, according to Ramsey's declaration, he added that any issues were promptly addressed. So he went to them, apparently, according to this, and said, hey, what's the deal? And yeah. those issues were addressed, and he was able to take care of it. I also know that that relationship was fully disclosed, right? It was sure. disclosed that, hey, I, I get money from these people to recommend you. That is different than a lot of people that you read on the internet. And it drives me crazy, OG, when we see people and there's somebody, hey, one woman just came out with a big podcast this year, hit it hard. When you go to anything that she writes online, she talks about, hey, use my favorite things. Never once discloses that these are affiliate links. Yeah, and affiliate links are the ones that she gets paid for when you click Absolutely. on them or you buy something, yes. you know, whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that? Is that what you're saying? If it's, like, if, if it's disclosed, right. there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. You know, Ramsey had this person as an advertiser. These people as an advertiser. Fully disclosed, this is an advertiser of mine. Mm -hmm. And and people also know that Ramsey doesn't like timeshares. So it seems like a natural fit. He probably did do some due diligence, like you said, probably wished he had more. But man, when you see some of these relationships online, and especially, and this, this cracks me up, people are like, no, you got to find out how your financial advisor is paid. By the way, I've got my favorite stuff over here. And never once discloses that this is a commission-based relationship. Drives me crazy. But let's get back to timeshares. What do you think about timeshares? Uh, I like to base all of my opinions on stuff based on things that I've done. <laughs> yeah. So I've never... my All of my timeshare experience is anecdotal and always crappy. But then I also know... Well, I shouldn't say always crappy. Mostly crappy. But then I also know people who have the Disney Vacation Club, which is ostensibly a timeshare at Disney and are in love with it. Like would not like that's their thing. And are I know just people so that happy. have, I know people have the Marriott system and yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah. 
I think everybody's got, uh, you know, a, a different, uh, kind of pro- probably a negative opinion about it because of, you know, you get the free postcard and then you got to go sit in the room for six hours and, you deceptive, know, the kind of deceptive sales practices, greasy feeling of getting the pitch versus I really like going to this Marriott in Scottsdale. So I should just come here every summer for, <laughs> no, you wouldn't want to come in the summer, be cheap, but you wouldn't want to go there. Uh, you know, in the, in the winter time, you know, whatever. And for the right person, it's the right thing. But I don't know. I, yeah. I have a little bit too much wanderlust for, for. Oh, me too. For, for yeah, me I can't do it. And I'll tell you that um, from the math perspective, I don't think it, I don't think it really works out. Like if they're trying to sell you on saving money with a timeshare, I'm not buying that. So that the maintenance fees can continually go up. I mean, a lot of the time what you're writing is this blank check, right? You're saying, hey, I'm signing up for this thing. I'm not really sure how I can get out of it. And you can change the management fees, usually up to X percent per year. And I can't really do anything about it, uh, whether I go or not. So I think math-wise, it doesn't make sense. But lifestyle-wise, ease of use, my friends that have had a great experience with it. uh, I experienced one in Cabo a year and a half ago, two years ago. It was I don't know, in the haste before COVID. Remember the time before COVID? All that? BC. Yeah, BC. <laughs> February, February 2020 BC. <laughs> I didn't even get the BC. I totally didn't. That's well done. Well played. Thank you. TM. Yes. But during that time, we went to Cabo and stayed at a timeshare, all inclusive place, had my little wristband, and had a wonderful time. Mm-hmm. Had a fantastic day. Yeah, because you, it wasn't yours. <laughs> We've done the Disney ones. At the vacation club, like locations, and we don't have a like. I love buying them from other people. Yeah. I love other people's timeshares. Those are the best kind. That's like your friend with a boat. Yeah, like you don't want a boat. Have a friend with a boat. Have yeah. So there's two ways into timeshares. There's number one, you want it, you like the lifestyle, you lean into it, and there are people that sit down and they they just get sold. Yeah, this timeshare. Oh yeah, and that happened to my mom. My mom got sold. I'll tell. I can tell this story. I think if she won't mind. Also, she probably won't listen to this episode. So. <laughs> What she doesn't know won't hurt. What she don't know don't hurt mama. Yes. She got strong armed. She called me one day and she goes, Hey, uh, wow, well, we didn't win. You know, you just talk to mom like, Hey, what's going on? And you know, what are you guys up to? Ah, we didn't win. Didn't win what? We didn't win what? Ah, we didn't win the truck. What do you mean? Well, there was a truck. There was a contest for a truck and, and we thought we were going to win. We didn't win. I go, How would you think that you're going to win? Like anything that has the truck as, a, as an outcome can't be. You know, you can't have a, uh, I feel like I'm going to win this one. So it was a timeshare pitch. It was, hey, you've got a key and maybe your key unlocks the door to this pickup truck and you win the truck. And it was all about, uh, all about camping. And she said, she goes, we didn't win the truck, but the good news is, is that when you guys come up here, you guys can camp all you want. And I was like, huh? Did you say the C word? No, I don't know if you know who I am, but, (laughs) but I might glamp, but I'm not necessarily going to be camping anywhere. I've done my camping. Uncle Sam paid for my camping on the sides of mountains and in deserts and all sorts of places. I'm good. I don't need to camp anymore. And so she goes on and tells a story about how they went to this thing and, and you know, it was a good deal and it could be used for generations of camping. And, the, you know, they, they upgraded to the family package. So everybody in the family, they're going to send me the card. And, and I'm like, I don't, I'm, I will never use this. See, and by the way, this is the line, OG, right here. It could be a good deal. It could be great, but when you take your lifestyle with what the offer is, it doesn't matter if it's a good deal if you're if you're not going to use it. It gets better. It. Oh, it, it does. gets better. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. And I said, so you you bought it? And mom says, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if we want to go camping. And I'm like, well, you're 60 years old. When was the last time you went camping? And she's like, I don't know, like <laughs> when I was in my teenage years with grandpa. I'm like, Okay. So is that something that's on but your I'm bucket list? To, I'm ready to start again. Yeah. I mean, are you, are you, I mean, cool, right? Like if you're going to like, Hey, we're going to pack up the camper and we're going to, we're going to travel the USA and we got all these free camping sites. All she needs to do is sleep on one of those damn cots one night at home. Like, like stretch it out in her living room and sleep on it one night and yeah. camping is what's gone. It like, what's it like to go camping? Well, take your sleeping bag and go lay it in the dirt when it's cold out and tell me if you're going to do that for the next. By the way, but, people love camping. Send your hate mail to OG at stackingbenjamins.com. Yeah. So not only has she not gone camping in 45 years, she said, well, you know, the real problem is we don't have a camper. <laughs> She's doing this math now. Yeah. 
No, no. This is the justification for buying a camper. Oh, for bu- oh, I see. We didn't win the truck. Now the domino is falling. But we definitely need a camper for this camping membership. And I'm like, put pump the brakes. A, you already have a camper. It's in the driveway. Well, that's an old camper. I understand, but you haven't moved it in 30 years. So what makes you think that the brand new one will do anything other than sit in the driveway? Secondly, you haven't gone camping in half a, a century. You know, like none of this stuff is making sense. You need to figure out a way to get out of this. It took her no, a year. It makes total sense because you know what you need? Once she buys the new camper, because I'm with her, the old camper won't do. You got to have the new camper. And the new and then truck you know what? to go with the That's new camper. That's because you, you didn't win the truck, so you got to buy the you truck. You got to buy the new truck. Yeah. So it yeah. took her a year to kind of unwind it. And, um, you know, finally just got to the point where it was just kind of one of those credit card things. You know, it was just the monthly thing was going on our credit card. So just call and just have them take it off your credit card. Just call the call the credit card company, say you dispute the charge. And that kind of started the dominoes of like, we can unwind this for you a year into it, which was kind doing, of frustrating. Doing this uh, research, OG, for this piece, I looked into, you know, everybody's heard about timeshare scams, but this thing that Ramsey's involved with, that industry, getting you out of the timeshare now is fraught with scammers. There's scammers all over that industry. So, scams to, to fix the scams? Yes. Scams to fix I'm the scams. I'm less scammy than that scammer. So therefore you should do business with me. There was a piece on the CBS evening news, uh, just earlier this year. And, uh, well, let's listen to these people and the reporter talking to them about their experience. The salesman was charming. They offered you a one-time payment of $18,000 to get out of your timeshare contract. Yes. Why was that appealing? I don't know why that was appealing. I can't even tell you why it was appealing because I don't even know why I did it. I can't tell you why it's appealing. I just said yes, which was, by the way, how I got into this in the first place. Yeah. $18,000 to get out of your timeshare. Yeah. Which was charging you, I believe the number was uh, $1,800 a year. $150 a month was the maintenance fee that they were trying to get out of. And of course, that maintenance fee was much higher than the one that they'd originally agreed to long ago. And now they're seniors, they're on a fixed income, and you can see, OG, why they want to get out. But $18,000 to get out of $1,800 a year when you're in your late sixties, early seventies, kind of slimy. Yeah. Not, not great. So I think uh, there's a lot of takeaways there. I think takeaway number one is timeshare is not right for a lot of people. I think you not only do the math, you got to seriously look at whether you actually want to go camping or not before you, before you sign up for the camping membership. And then uh, second is these companies that try to convince you that your life is going to be great if you just pay them a big amount of money, again, the math, it's got to be the math. But coming up next, we've got Helen Russell. I'm so excited for this interview. Helen's last book was called The Year of Living Danishly. And uh, nice. because it turns out that Danish people, OG, are the happiest people on earth. And they're among the top in productivity, too. They work far fewer hours than other countries, other societies. And they get as much done. They don't work fewer hours than Doug. <laughs> they, they do not. Oh, look at that. Look at, look at the, uh, he's giving you a, a, a nice symbol there, OG. Number one, I'm number one. Yes. She uh, has, of course, a long stating column for The Telegraph. She writes for The Guardian. She was formerly the editor of uh, Marie Claire UK. She is an amazing TEDx talk, Action for Happiness. And now she, as a result of experiencing happy, knows that happiness can't come without, uh, without knowing sadness as well. Helen Russell coming up, but okay. All right. All right. I got to scoot over here. Uh, Doug, what do we got, man? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm here to step in with a mind bender before you head off to learn how to be sad with our friend, Helen Russell. I know this show's called stacking Benjamins, but first We got to learn how to stack a single dollar, don't we? So here's a question. Don't peek. On the back of a dollar bill is an eagle with a shield. How many stripes are on the shield? I'll be back with the answer and the why behind it just after I give you a couple of minutes to come up with your best guess. I said don't peek. Picking the right holiday gift can be hard, but it doesn't have to be. We went ahead and asked clients and employees. They want Omaha Steaks. 
Don't worry about planning because every step of the way, a dedicated concierge will assist you, making the process of ordering simple and easy. Visit omahasteaks.com slash BMT and you'll get free shipping, volume discounts, and customizable options to fit your needs. Each box is a gift that keeps on giving, from delicious butcher-cut filet mignons, juicy burgers to decadent caramel apple tartlets. There's something for everyone. Send them a memorable gift at omahasteaks.com slash BMT today. Every item is flash frozen and safely delivered to their doorstep. From the time it arrives to the moment they experience it, Omaha Steaks shows you care and is the gift everyone really wants. Visit omahasteaks.com slash BMT and give people a reason to celebrate. Send Omaha Steaks. It's just good business. Right now, I'm wearing some Felix Gray Specs while I talk to you about Felix Gray because five years ago, Felix Gray realized, you know what? Our eyes aren't meant to look at screens all day. And they designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday way more productive. And now more than ever, Americans are spending more time on computers. I spend my entire day in front of computers, either writing scripts, recording shows, doing social media stuff. It is all day on the computer, and it's probably like it for you. Between your computer, your phone, your tablet, your gaming, so many other sources of blue light, Felix Gray glasses aren't like other blue light lenses. Felix Gray lenses filter 15% more blue light that can make screen time tough on your eyes and also disruptive to your sleep. You can go with non-prescription. That's what I have. If you've seen my videos, doesn't mean I don't need prescription. I need those for far, far away. And I'm always standing right on top of my computer. So non-prescription and prescription are available. Check them out now. Felixgrayglasses.com slash stacker. My classic uh, black frame is one of many different types I'm wearing the Nash, so if you've seen any of our social media, you're seeing me with the Nash on. But there's lots of different types to choose from. Very easy company to work with, and with their 30-day money-back guarantee, you got nothing to lose but your eye strain. Eye strain? Eye strain. Get yourself a pair of glasses made for 21st century and designed for modern, hardworking eyes like yours and mine. You got nothing to lose except maybe... I strain. There we go. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash stacker for the best blue light glasses in the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com stacker. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. Felixgrayglasses.com slash stacker. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm here with some trivia on the first dollar in your stack, the $1 bill. The question was, on the back of the bill is an eagle with a shield. How many stripes are on that shield? The U.S. dollar bill has lots of Easter eggs, as they call them, pointing to the number 13 and the original 13 colonies. The pyramid on the back of the bill has 13 steps. There are 13 horizontal stripes on the top of the shield, 13 stars on the eagle, and 13 leaves and 13 berries on the olive branch of the eagle's talons. And the other talon holds 13 arrows. There are also 13 stars above the key on the Department of Treasury seal. But the answer to this question, of course, there are 13 vertical bars running down the shield. Cool, huh? Even cooler? Learning how to be sad. Here's Joe and Helen Russell. And on my dad's shortwave radio, it's my new friend, Helen Russell. Helen, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm fantastic, but I have to say, this project of yours is a heck of a departure from living Danishly. This is like the opposite of living Danishly. Well, I feel as though some people think that, but for me, it's a sort of natural progression. And back when we could travel the world, I would go around and talk about my work and happiness research. And I just came to realize that many of us have quite a narrow definition of happiness that means never being sad. And that was never the point. So this is kind of setting the record straight for a lot of people out there. Uh, you begin this book, I, I feel almost an A.A. A. Milne quality. I don't know if this was on purpose, but the story that you, you kick things off with 
you write like a Melanin Winnie the Pooh in all capitals that a very capital V sad capital S thing had happened in your family. Can you start the story there and what had happened? Because I think this is a great way to introduce people to what you're talking about. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I was just about to turn three. My baby sister died from sudden infant death syndrome. And at the time in the 80s, nobody really talked about it. And nobody really talked about it to my mum or me. My mum and dad split up soon after and no one really told me what was happening there either. And it all sort of it came to rather a head at school when a teacher showed my mum a picture I had drawn of me and my sister and my dad. And my mum went white and had to talk to explain that half of the people in the picture were no longer there, which was news to me. So I grew up, as many of us do, with this idea that what you don't talk about can't hurt you and you just want to be like Riley in Inside Out. You want to be the good girl. You want to be happy all the time and sort of pursuing happiness and trying to push down sadness and avoiding sadness, thinking that it was a bad thing. But that doesn't work. And so it's been a personal journey as well as a professional one to really uncover why being sad is important and how it can actually help us to be properly happy and live a properly more fulfilled life long term. Yeah. Reading about your mom's reaction, which obviously is is incredibly normal and is a reaction most of us have, but it, but it becomes insidious. You talk about the more you try to bottle up your sadness, the more it kind of, I don't know, ekes out all over the place. I think so. But I mean, that's what happens. It's like sort of pushing, pushing a ball underwater. It will just pop up. That sadness isn't going to go anywhere. It can't. And if we can sit with it, studies now show over decades that we can process it and it will more likely to move on more quickly. But yeah, if we, if we bury it down and we try and bury it with busyness or like working all the time or, you know, food or drink or whatever our crutch of choice may be. And I have tried most of them it is more likely to tip into something more serious. And of course, depression is a chronic mental illness that needs help. And I've had that too, got all the t-shirts, but sadness on the other hand is temporary and it can be awakening. It's a, it's a message to tell us when something is wrong in our lives that makes us stop, but we have to listen to it. So it's about learning to do that. I'm glad you mentioned that Helen, because you make it very clear that sadness goes away. Like you just said, it's temporary depression. Sometimes you have to go get professional help. Absolutely. And I, and having, you know, been there for both of these things, I am all for talking therapies and on medication, if that's what, what helps people. And I've done those too. It's really important though, so that we don't pathologize normal sadness. We have a propensity to try and take away any sort of discomfort with technology or medicine, but sadness normal sadness that happens to all of us is something that we just have to experience that can feel very hard because most of us haven't been taught how and haven't grown up doing it. So we kind of have to relearn it as adults. You, you quote Desmond Tutu in the book, and this is an apropos quote. I'm sorry to say that suffering is not optional. And, and you mentioned that you've talked to lots of people, of course, as I thought about it, as I'm reading your words, I have too, where they're in some of the worst times of their life, Helen, and, and they tell you, oh, I just want to be happy. I want to be happy. And you kind of dissuade people from that. We should lean into this feeling a little bit. Well, I just think, and I've actually spoken to Desmond Tutu's daughter and granddaughter about this as well, but sadness is what we're supposed to feel after a loss. And sorrow is the same response when sad things happen. So in a global pandemic, for instance, it's okay to be sad. And sometimes we need to be sad. But if we are conditioned to be so averse to negative emotions, in inverted commas, that we don't even recognize them or give ourselves permission to feel them, then we can almost experience a sort of shame around that. And, and that's going to make us feel worse. That's not going to help us at all. And actually, there are some, some good things accepting and allowing for temporary sadness, researchers have found, helps improve our attention to detail. It increases perseverance, promotes generosity, makes us more grateful for what we've got, even more clear eyed. I was fascinated to find out that it makes us less likely to fall for the halo effect where we think the, the beautiful and rich usually can do no wrong. And the fundamental attribution error where we assume the worst, we are much more level headed. We are better people almost when we are sad. So we shouldn't push that away if it comes calling every I, once in a while. I want to lean into that more in just a second. But as you were talking, I was just wondering, has COVID made us sadder? That's a really interesting question. And actually, the World Happiness Report, even though it's called the World Happiness Report, has, has done some digging here. 
interestingly, although our so-called happiness levels haven't declined hugely, we've been on the whole quite resilient, we are experiencing more occurrences of feeling sad, if that makes sense, worldwide. So yes, I think that taking away the busyness of normal life as the world shut down and we didn't travel and we didn't have perhaps that in-person support and all of the normal mechanisms we rely on to help us when we're feeling sad, those are stripped away and we are social beings. The only mammal that survives solo is a pygmy hippo. So yeah, we are we, we struggled because we had that loss of connection and we didn't have any of the busyness of normal lives to distract us. So we have experienced a lot more sadness during COVID. There are days, Helen, where I feel like it might be better just be a pygmy hippo. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a, very cute. It would be a, be a way better thing instead of all this socialization going on. I don't know. I, I do have days. Well, I think, you know, connection, they say now, like, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection and, and connection is is kind of what it's all about, even when it feels hard. And I think many of us, technology is a wonderful thing in many ways, but we can hide behind screens these days. And, you know, talking to you now, the opportunity to have interesting conversations and to connect on a human level is still so important. And that's what's going to get us through all this. You kind of lay out a roadmap for us uh, at the beginning of your work. You talk about how There's kind of a biological method to our sadness, right? Like we experience more sadness as we get a little older. And then is it U-shaped? Was that was that the research? Yes. So I think um, not wishing to cast aspersions, but I think perhaps you and and I are in the middle of the U-shape. There's a (laughs) U-shaped curve whereby we are happier at either end of our life. And we have a little dip from maybe around the age of 40 to around 47 is the biggest bit of the dip. And it's thought that this is because evolutionary speaking, we see it in in monkeys as well. It's thought that because at the beginning of our life, we have fewer resources um, in terms of, I know, we don't have perhaps very well paying jobs. We don't have as many bananas if we're monkeys. So we need to be quite optimistic. But as the years go by and we reach the end of our lives, we we learn to appreciate what really matters and the people and stop chasing big bananas or Ferraris or whatever it may be and learn to really kind of live in the moment and be grateful for what we've got. So they used to think it was because we had the pressures of, you know, perhaps caring for children or caring for aging parents and a a busy job, but actually we see it throughout the animal kingdom. So it's, there's something toward about going towards the end of life where you realign your priorities in a way that makes us feel better. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's biological. And we throw on this phrase, Helen, that it will get better tomorrow, but what you're saying is maybe not tomorrow, but it will get better. It will get ready a few tomorrows. Yeah. And there's also, I mean, there's lots of so interesting. Charles Darwin famously denied the usefulness of tears. But we know now that actually crying does make us feel better. It reduces our cortisol levels. So the stress hormone, because we are expressing our sadness. So it's expressing that that makes us feel better and we feel soothed afterwards. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting biological factors that play into our sadness that perhaps we don't grow up learning about in school. You say we feel like we don't deserve to be sad. What does that mean? I think there is often a a sense that if we are fortunate enough to have a roof over our heads and and food in our refrigerators, that, you know, um, some pain is is less legitimate. But we, we are all allowed to feel sad. There are not sort of hierarchies of grief. And no matter what our situation and, and where we come from, if we are experiencing that, that feeling of sadness or disappointment or loss, we will be sad. And, and I think many of us feel, oh, there are other people worse off. And of course, that's true. And then we should all be activists. And one of the big things that I talk about to, to help us out of a, a funk of sadness or a, a low patch is doing something for someone else. It's acts of service. So by all means, if you feel like I shouldn't be as sad as I should be because other people have it worse, then do something to help those other people. But you're still allowed to feel sad because that's normal. That's very interesting. Acts of service. So getting beyond yourself, getting out of your head is is one of the top ways to solve this sadness. I, I don't even want to call it an issue because you talk about how normal it is to be sad and how we should kind of lean into it. But But if you want to path out, acts of service. Yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, I'm British, which we don't do brilliantly on sadness, but Americans are outliers in the desire to avoid sadness at all costs. So it, it yes, we are. Like, yeah, in East Asia, for example, there is much more acceptance of sadness. And Russia as well is more nuance and granularity. I heard some comedian happy. the other day, I heard a British comedian talk about how much Brits lean into sadness. Like there are people in your culture that just relish it and absolutely love it. And hey, everything needs to be miserable if we're all doing okay. Well, I think that's there's a sort of self-deprecation. So we don't like to sort of 
shout about it perhaps when things are going well but there is also that still that hangover of the stiff upper lip right, and right. keep calm carry on so, right yeah. but, but 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 you're right that's not us we will avoid it at all costs no 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 i'm okay i'm okay you're the one having <laughs> problems i'm fine helen everything's good but yeah doing things for other people in acts of service there's a whole economic theory around warm glow giving so we should do it because it's the right thing to do but also mri scans show that when we do something good for someone else our brain lights up with the pleasure of doing good giving money to charity donating volunteering, it all makes us feel better as well. So there's a lot of science behind that. I want to go even lighter than that, because I think that's that's phenomenal. But you don't begin there. You begin with just this idea of, especially Americans, you say, we fight it. Don't Don't fight it. Yes. And I know this can feel like a big hurdle. And I'm speaking to lots of people at the moment who are who are really resistant here. And, and I completely understand why everything in our culture is, has urged us against it. But yes, and it's sort of this idea of a wave coming towards us and we can either try and be swept over by it or we can just try and ride it. And I think there's a great technique called emotional arousal, whereby if we feel we're perhaps on the edge of a feeling, we can feel like I just feel things aren't going so well, or maybe I just need a bit of a cry, then music, for example, or films can give us that release, that catharsis, or it can stir something in us to make us feel something and it can give us a bit of a kickstart, can be helpful. Yeah. So I think it, the first, very first rule of how to be sad well is, is not to fight the sad. Can we talk about crying for a second? Crying helps? Yeah, crying. So crying reduces cortisol. It can be very bonding. You're, you're sending a social message to the people around you that I need you. I, I need help. Interestingly, women do cry more than men, but it's not necessarily biological. It's because we are trained from the age of about 10 that still that, that terrible old idea that boys don't cry. Um, so by, by 10 to 13, you see girls cry more, but often out of frustration because girls are educated that they shouldn't perhaps get angry. And so they are advised to perhaps pick frustration or, or feelings of, of just wanting to weep out of that a feeling of helplessness off the shelf. Whereas men are encouraged not to feel sad, to pick anger off the bookshelf of emotion. So there's plenty to do. I, I found that quite helpful as well, that there is a lot we can do to help change things for the better. And yeah, everybody should be able to cry when they need to. You write that the late psychologist, I'm going to pronounce this name wrong, Harry, Harry Gano, wrote in a book called Between Parent and Child that, quote, many people had been educated out of knowing what their feelings are. I found that pretty profound, but what does that mean? Yeah, I, I found that profound as well. It's this idea that if we, and you you still see it with parenting and there's still that absolute urge. I do it, I feel the urge to almost do it to my own kids. But if a child falls over, you tell them, oh, you're okay, or don't cry. Or if a child tells you that they are scared, you say, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's this idea of wanting to minimize pain for a child that comes from a, a good place as a parent, for example. But actually what that does is make the child distrust their own feelings and they learn not to not to really believe themselves or, or to take their own emotions seriously. And this can lead to a great sense of shame as well, because if you still feel scared and your primary caregiver has told you that there's nothing to be afraid of, you think, well, what's wrong with me? I, I still feel like this. I must be there must be something broken in me. So, yeah, it's really problematic. And I think that's another quick win in a way, if we can be aware of that. And anyone who interacts with children to be aware of not minimizing a child's emotion, but listening then we are going to have a, a more emotionally literate next generation. I feel like the older I get, Helen, as I'm listening to you, the more that I'm learning to trust myself, trust my gut. I think that's what you're saying here. Yeah. And I think it's something that we would have naturally, but you're right. We, it's socialized out of us. So, and it, but that's a cultural thing as well. You know, in, in Russia, for example, I, I spoke to professors in Russia who talked about the fact that in Russia, there is a sense that feeling sad is okay. And so children are not discouraged out of it. Lots of children's books have really unhappy endings, which is so different to the kind of Disney world that maybe many of us have been brought up with. But yeah, if we are not afraid of sad endings, and if we learn to accept all of our emotions, all of the spectrum, we are going to be more resilient as we grow up. Yeah, I read even the original writings or the older writings of some of the fairy tales that we've read, and those are just downright morbid, Helen. They really are. I'm studying Hans Christian Andersen at the Oh, moment. are you? The real, yeah. Oh, the real Little Mermaid, dark, dark, dark. Wow, that's some creepy, <laughs> creepy stuff. You go from don't fight it into another topic, and the way that you get there goes back to your situation. So your father has left. You've had this time of extreme sadness, and now there is a man with an orange backpack 
uh, by the way, I, I laughed through this uh, uh, because you're not sure what to make of the orange man with the orange backpack. He seems to be around a lot. He hasn't been introduced to you. You've been introduced to him. You're not really sure what to do. And at the same time, your own uh, father is becoming more, uh, it, it feels like he's becoming more distant and he's, he's forgetting about half of his family a lot. And you say that this creates expectations. Uh, to, tell me a little bit about this. Well, again, I think it's it's growing up watching the TV or, or movie ideal. So yeah, I'd be a little five-year-old girl with pigtails waiting for my dad to pick me up and he would forget or he would be very late or he just wouldn't come at all. And then he decides he's going to remarry. And in every movie I'd ever seen, every kind of Disney film, there was this idea that, well, of course, the original daughter gets to be bridesmaid at this wedding and I maybe would get a tiara. I thought maybe I'd get to ride a pony. I'd seen a movie somewhere. I had really sort of grand plans for this. And we'd, I'd just have two families. Maybe Orange Backpack would marry my mom and we'd get a dog and it would all just be lovely. <laughs> it's like it's part of your wedding. This yeah, is fantastic. Exactly. Everybody's yeah. going to live happily ever after. I just thought for sure I would get a new dress and a tiara out of it. But, you know, it, life doesn't work out like that. It's it's messy. I'm, you know, lowering my expectations about the people around me is something that, that I had to do as a survival mechanism. And I'm not necessarily advocating that children should have to do that. But I think as an adult, there was something in me that from my upbringing, I really struggle to lower my expectations for myself. And I think when we are sad, we have to lower our expectations. We are not going to be as productive or as confident perhaps as we might be the rest of the time when we are having a very difficult time. Although interestingly, sadness is a really good emotion for, for rumination and creativity, because if we are happy, we just do the same thing we did last time. But whereas if we're sad, we stop and we think, well, we need to do something different. So it is good for creativity. But yeah, we certainly need to lower expectations in terms of what we're going to create, what we're going to have as our output during that time. Two things there. First one, and you don't say why in the book, but you, you asked your dad if you could be in the wedding and he kind of tells you, oh, no, 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 no. But you don't say why not? Why? Why would your dad not let you be in the wedding? Do you know, I still don't know. And I don't have a relationship with him now. And my mom says she doesn't know. So I don't know. But it's just, yeah, it no. still hurts. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second thing is I can see that sadness is great for creativity because a great British band, The Cure, I feel like Robert Smith from The Cure, talk about Boys Don't Cry, right? Robert <laughs> Robert Smith, I feel like has been sad for how many years? 70 years or how, however old he is? He's still touring. So, I mean, he's he's doing all right now, but yes. yeah. That yeah. guy's cleaning up on sadness, Helen. <laughs> he's got a lot of makeup to buy. I mean, he's, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's got expensive. He certainly does. I feel like a big part of what you're saying here is that we can't experience true happiness if we don't experience real sadness. Is that, would that be a fair statement? That's right. Because if we are shutting down, if we're trying not to feel sad, we're really trying not to feel, and then we are never going to experience true fulfillment. You know, the, the cost of Feeling our sadness can feel overwhelming, but the cost of not doing so is far greater. And the longer we wait to face it, the worse it will become. And actually, it's quite modern, this idea of, of happiness, meaning never being sad. And it's quite Western as well. In in China, for example, they have Zing Fu, this idea, not of a good mood, but a good life, one that is sufficient and sustainable and has meaning, but it will include some suffering in there. And going back to like Aristotle and the Greeks, his idea was that a good life will be hard at times. It will be difficult. But if we are engaged and if we do the hard things, even when they feel difficult, we will have a good life. So yeah, we're not supposed to feel happy all the time. We're supposed to feel everything. I normally stop the interview there and I like to just talk to, and I told you before we hit record that I like just talking about the very beginning of the book. I don't like, I don't like talking about the rest of it because people love this topic. I would do it, you a disservice and our listener a disservice if I try to speed through this stuff. But, but, but you do later on before you get to, I like the chapter on going pro about, about really, about really being a professional and about buddies and about talking. I thought that was important, but you talk about the fallacy of arrival. What is the fallacy of arrival? So this is a term coined by Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, who was at Harvard for many years. And he discovered that actually, as we pursue something, if we're pursuing whatever our goal might be, a new job, new relationship, whatever it might be, on the way there, we get the, the dopamine is in the chase. And when we get the thing that we think we wanted, we feel nothing. It, it, the dopamine drops off. 
once we are aware of this, you start to see it around all the time. And it's the fallacy of arrival. It's almost this anticlimax when you get the thing you think you wanted. Sometimes it's called summit syndrome. I spoke to lots of mountaineers or endurance athletes who said, yeah, I got to the North Pole. It just looked a bit a bit shabby. <laughs> I wasn't that impressed. And But it can also apply to things like being a parent or marriage. So even some really everyday workaday things, if we have unrealistic expectations, we are more likely to experience the arrival fallacy, the fallacy of arrival. And actually the way parenting and the way relationships are portrayed and sold to us from the moment that we're born, from every Hollywood movie, from the media, we do have unrealistic expectations, many of us, and relationships are hard and parenting is hard and everything is hard, but it, it's still worth doing. But if we are more aware of this, we're less likely to feel that that sense of anticlimax and that, ooh, that sort of mere yeah. feeling. Yeah. Well, and for her, for hear us on a money show, this is the lie. I think that a lot of people think when it comes around some of this goal achievement, you know, I, I get X amount of money, Helen, and things are going to finally be great, right? I'm going to reach retirement or I'm going to send my kids off to college or I'm going to get that second home or whatever that is. We have that. I'm going to arrive and then it's going to be wonderful. And to your point, that expectation kind of kills it. Yeah, absolutely. And external, extrinsic motivation like like money or like status, or as though we're trying to sort of impress a parent or something, that's more likely to to end in, in anticlimax and that feeling of a real letdown and hollowness and emptiness at the end. So yeah, a much better route, I guess, is intrinsic mot- motivation. It's things that matter to us doing a job because we like it or um, starting investing in, in something because we really believe in it. We know enough by now to not be so naive to think that you need a certain amount of money to to buy the well-being that is necessary for happiness. But beyond a certain threshold, it's not going to make much difference. And actually, it's experiences rather than stuff that make us happy. When I talk to creators like yourself, well, actually, you're a very special case because you're somebody who's a happiness expert. So you're really digging into the other side of this. And to your point, it really is a part of a continuum. But did anything surprise you while you were researching this stuff while you're researching sadness, anything really stick out that you did not expect? I think for me, there was a lot that was really interesting around feeling disconnected and addiction or proneness to unhelpful coping mechanisms. And addiction can sound quite big and scary, but actually if you, if you drill down in it, most of us have something that is our go-to crutch. It's not perhaps the healthiest option. And we'll all have experienced it you know, when we're watching TV and maybe there's something socially awkward happening or and we reach for our phone or so we feel a bit bored and we try and alleviate that that fear by by going for, for social media or by getting a snack from, from the kitchen. And I think it's really interesting to to stop and be aware of that and think what is the impulse behind my actions here? Is it because I'm uncomfortable in some way? So that was really interesting. And then just the sheer wealth of information out there in terms of how sadness has been misunderstood over the years. I mean, for years. So there's just a lot of data now that shows that actually trying to suppress sadness makes it worse. Um, Any kind of thought suppression doesn't work. So we may as well find useful ways to be sad well. The book is called How to Be Sad. I I absolutely loved it. I thought that this is such important work for, especially for a bunch of people that are trying to get happiness. I mean, that's why a lot of people, Helen, listen to our show. And I was attracted to it because you have to be sad to experience that happiness. It's available everywhere. That's right. Available everywhere now. Thank you. I'm Jen from the Frugal Friends Podcast, and when I'm not cutting the end of the toothpaste tube off to get that last little bit of toothpaste, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Helen. It's so true. So, so, so true. You can't, you can't think I'm going to be happy later when I reach this thing if you're not happy now. Yep. Very true. The myth of I'm going to retire and everything's going to be great is is very frustrating. Of course, uh, uh, in our Facebook group, The Basement, one of our friends, somebody that, oh, gee, you and I know, I don't know if you saw this post, talking about her dad who just retired and he's miserable. Because there's no purpose, right? I mean, you got to know what the next thing is. It sounds very cliche to say you got to retire to something. But if you actually take the words retire and like it means withdrawal from, like that doesn't sound very fun. You know, I'm I'm going to retire to the study. 
you know, like, yeah, that doesn't mean like I'm going to go no. have fun in the study. That means, yes, right. <laughs> that means I'm going to go have my bourbon and cigar and retire. The language is important. And I really like our friend, uh, Eric Brotman's uh, language, you know, don't retire, graduate because graduate assumes that you're headed on to this new period of, you know, excitement and fun and doing and all this stuff. I remember how excited I was to graduate because of the fact that I was going to enter this whole new phase of my life instead of retire. Yeah. Good stuff. Also, I, and, and, you know, she said it twice, but we'll say it again here. Big difference between sadness and depression, lean into sadness, depression. You really need to consider getting some help because that's a, that's a whole different ball game. OG agreed. I'm, I'm glad she talked about that. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency put what you value first. Oh, I'm going to say uh, right now what I'm working on is first of the month budgeting. So <laughs> that's that's what I charting out our upcoming tour and all the financial wrangling that needs to happen for that to, to live uh, come in, to fruition. Live in the dream. Can't wait to announce some of the dates. I know where we're going. What do you want, Brennan? This is my online poker time. I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm ready to take on the Catalina wine mixer. Ho, ho, slow down there, speed racer. I know what it entails, and I'm ready to nail it. I want it, okay? I want the Catalina wine mixer. Yo, yo. Hey, D-Man. Just tell him what's up. I just did. Hey. <laughs> hey, your brother wants a shot at the Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm walking tall. You think you're ready to run with the bulls? I've been earning and burning, snapping necks and cashing checks. Screw it. Let's let him do it. No, it's a win-win for me. Because if you f*** up, Brennan, if you f*** up, yeah. I get to fire your ass. But if you pull it off, I look like a genius to the board. <laughs> okay? I get it. Look, Brennan, here's the thing. It's the Catalina f- wine mixer. Okay? <laughs> Are you saying pow? What are you saying? <laughs> it's the biggest helicopter leasing event in the Western Hemisphere since 1997. <laughs> Why does he keep doing that? I have to sell or lease at least 80 choppers to make my nut. And you, yeah. you mess with my nut, Brennan? Okay. Wait a second, we are not prepared <laughs> to announce yet exactly where we're going to be holding this event, but it may have something to do with the Catalina wine mixer. Please, God. <laughs> I could actually announce it has nothing to do with the Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> it's the largest helicopter <laughs> leasing event since 1997. Where, where you pull these from is, is beyond me. Hey, we're in the middle of the Haven Life Read. Thank God. It's actually your loved ones in your time. And so you buy term life insurance and get on with your life, OG. Their application simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, no waiting for a decision, not a ton of forms, very simple, concise, all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, of course, which is more than 160 years old. A lot of the companies they compete against in the in sure tech space, brand new companies versus a company that's been there and has seen this before, which is, I think, uh, says a lot. Uh, today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to JT. Say hi, JT. Hi, Joe and OG. Thanks for all the solid advice and love the show. My old man was telling me this week where he buried all his AOL and GeoCities passwords and mentioned something that I know very little about. He mentioned required minimum distributions, and I'm pretty sure it didn't have to do with the amount of ice cream I should expect when he dishes it out. What's the percentage for required minimum distributions? Does it change as you get older or if your net worth is some threshold? I've always been told that at some point in the future, you have to take the money. But how's that actually work? In his case, he's still working. Does that matter? Let me know if you can point it towards anything or what I should tell him. Speaking of ice cream, those extra larges fit me like halter tops. So we better go with a 2X on this one. I've been lifting a lot of spare tires after all. See ya. <laughs> Thanks for the question. JT and uh, I, I wouldn't it be great if you walk into a Baskin Robbins and there was a required minimum distribution they had to give you. No, I'm sorry, that's too little. I'm I am put that in the uh, in the new tax bill that they're throwing through Congress right now. You have to serve X amount of ice cream. Yeah, you're required to give me this amount of ice cream. Yes, I'm sorry, I don't make the laws. You just gotta tax the rich. Give, give me give me more <laughs> Baskin Robbins withholding. Exactly. That's the stock. It's not GameStop. Yeah. Baskin Robbins. Give me some ice cream. Yeah. Hey, uh, requirement of distributions. Are, this is a great question, JT, and I'll tell you why. Is that a lot of people shoving money into retirement accounts right now, and they have no idea, uh, no plan about how I'm going to take the money out. And having a strategy around taking that money out, I think, is a very, very important step to 
get as much out as you possibly can. But how do requirement dis- distributions work, OG? Well, first, I'm going to put an asterisk next to everything here because, you know, there's some new tax laws going through Congress right now that uh, may change all of this. You and know, it also uh, just changed recently. Did. Yeah, not that long ago. Yeah, I don't get the obsession with random dates. I, I can wrap my head around age 70. I cannot wrap my head around age 70 and a half. And then you'd say, well, if it's 70 and a half, right? It's just, no, no, it's the April 1st following the year in which you turn 70. It's like, holy crap. Duh, and, and why not? And then they just changed it to 72. Yeah. Okay, fine. Now they're thinking about maybe 75. Who knows? 72 right now. Basically, a required minimum distribution is the amount of money you are forced to take out of your qualified tax-deferred plans every year as you are in retirement. If you are still working and you're over the required distribution age, as long as you're contributing to that account, i.e. your 401k, you don't have to do required distributions. But if you have an IRA or something, you will. But most people retire and then sometime at the end of the year, you go, oh crap, I got to take money out of my IRA. And the first year is roughly about 3%. It does escalate as you get older. You think about it like this. It's basically the IRS calculating how long you have to live and how how fast you have to take the money out based on your life expectancy from the year in which you are presently. So it starts at 3%, but then when you're 92, you know, it's closer to 20% of whatever your balance is because you don't have a lot of time left, allegedly, according to the IRS. So uh, what you're talking about, Joe, when you say people don't have a plan for taking the money out, you know, this becomes a really big issue because if you've got a pension or you've got Social Security and all of these other sorts of benefits in retirement, like Medicare and the tax rate on your Social Security is all based on how much money you have taxable income. If you have a, a retirement account that has $3 million in it and you're 75 years old, you're going to be taken out probably somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred grand out of that account this year just to pay taxes on it. You don't have to spend it. You don't have to consume the money, but you have to take it out of your IRA, make it into your brokerage account or into your savings account, whatever, pay taxes along the way. But now that's earned income. You have $200,000 of earned income plus your social security, plus your pension, plus your spouse's social security, plus your spouse's pension. And all of a sudden now, now you're, now you're making 300 grand, but you're really not. So that's why it's important. I think while you're kind of in your forties and fifties to start thinking about the forecasting, the hard part about this being on this side of the table, on the planning side of it, is that you don't believe me. And what I mean by you don't believe me is when I say, hey, so your IRA is going to be worth $3 million when you're 75. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) No, it's not. No, 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 no. No, I don't buy that for a second. And, you know, it's the power of compounding. So this applies to qualified plans that are pre-tax. Your Roth accounts have no required distributions. So that's kind of cool. You just grow that money tax-free. There's some stuff floating through Congress right now about if you have too much in your IRAs, they're going to require you to take money out regardless of how old you are. Uh, That number is forecast to be a really high number right now, but who knows, they can change it. They have some stuff going on with uh, Roth conversions and backdoor contributions and mega backdoor contributions and kind of changing that whole dynamic. That's kind of a big, big thing on the chopping block right now. So so I think there's a lot of stuff coming down range, but if you're, you know, if you're in your 40s or 50s and you're thinking about this, you have to start kind of piecing it together. What your dad may have also told you is that if he passes away and has a qualified account, now you have RMDs on his money. And there's a whole different formula that you follow based on whether or not he was over 70 or under 70 and you know whether he was taking money out or not and, and you know the years in which he did and and when he passes away and all that other sort of stuff, you're going to definitely need some help from a tax person or a financial planner, you know, immediately when dad, pa- I mean, you know, it sounds like he's healthy, but you know, it's nothing you want to trifle with because here's the penalty. This is the, this is the really kind of mind boggling mistake. So, so let's say that your required distribution is 200,000 and you say, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't need the money. What are they going to do to me? Going to leave it in. Or I forgot. Yeah, I forgot that I was, you know, I didn't, I needed to need the cash. I, 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 I more likely, much I, more likely. I wasn't paying attention. The penalty is 50% of the amount that you should have withdrawn. Plus, they calculate your taxes as if you made the withdrawal and tax you accordingly. So your $200,000 tax rate on that is, can we round and say 40% state and federal? So we'll round and say 40% state and federal. So that's 80 grand, right? But the penalty for not withdrawing it is 100 grand. So on your tax forms, the year that you miss it, 
you will see a tax bill for $180,000 because you forgot to take out your 200. And by the way, where do you think you're going to get your 200 from? Or where do you think you're going to get the 180 from to pay the tax bill? You're going to take it out of your IRA. And guess when that happens? The following year. And then guess what happens with that 200 grand? You pay taxes on it again. It's a cluster of misery. It is a gigantic swirling cluster bomb of IRS madness. Tornado. My understanding too is obviously the IRS finds this out later, right? Oh, and yeah, then, yeah. This is not, yeah, and then you got penalties. Yeah, this isn't yeah. something they call you on like January 3rd, go, oh, dude, you missed it. Yeah, it was three days ago. They call yeah. you in January of 2029 and go, guess what? We just got to your tax return from 2021. <sighs> Turns out you screwed it up. And you get taxes and fees and penalties based on all the time that they didn't notice it as well. Yes. Yeah, not good. Staying on top of required minimum distributions. Incredibly important. The other thing, I, the only thing I have to add it here, OG, is that this is why I like tax diversification over optimization. Is it so I've got some money in different buckets because, you know, you look at the Congress stuff going on right now, you don't know where the law is headed. You don't have any idea. And when it changes, having some flexibility to work around that, I think it is hugely important. And the more likely scenario when you're thinking about your distribution planning is you're going to need some of that money. Right. Like some people are blessed enough to have so much that they're just like, whatever, I don't, you know, I don't need any of this. But in in more likely cases, you're going to be consuming some of that money for your lifestyle expenses. I mean, to your point, being able to kind of pick from what bucket you want to use and strategize around that. You say, oh, well, this thing's coming down range in 2022. Maybe in 2021, I want to do this to take advantage of this opportunity. You know, I've got enough money in my non qualified account to live on this year so I can do a conversion on $50,000 at almost zero taxes because I, I've got income that I, I can live on, but it's not income from a tax standpoint. I'm using air quotes, income from an IRS standpoint. So I can do this conversion, pull this money out tax-free. You know, there's a lot of flexibility, but you only have that flexibility if you have money in different places. If all your money's in your 401k and it's all pre-tax because you were optimizing my tax strategy when I was 38 to pay the lowest amount of taxes, you're like, well, this is the other end of that stick. Because we don't know what the future is, I think you have to absolutely have money in all, all three buckets. Thanks for the question, JT. And uh, JT has a business apparently working in the rubber industry, carrying around spare tires all mm-hmm. the time. Yeah. So good work. Somebody's got to do that. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail if you've got a question for us. And we'd love to dive into just another great overlooked but very important topic, JT, like yours, which is uh, this issue of required minimum distributions. All right, that's going to do it for today. We've got a lot of people to thank, and Doug uh, coming back down the stairs, getting ready to do that. Last but not least, Hero G and his team are taking clients. And so if you're looking to think bigger with your financial planning than you have before, make better decisions for the rest of 2021, 2022, and beyond, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG links you to their calendar and you can then talk to them about how they'd interface with you to make those better decisions. All right, that's going to do it. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline. While timeshares aren't inherently bad or companies who get you out of timeshares, there are lots of snake oil salespeople in this industry. Beware of hard closes and walk away. Also, don't forget to look at a good cost-benefit benefit before going camping. Second, take a lesson from Helen Russell. Want to be happy? Lean into the sad times and experience them. You can't lead a happy life without some struggles to get there. But the big lesson? Don't take your dollar out to show Joe's mom just how cool all the hidden 13s are all over it. She'll remind you of your rent payment and confiscate it. Now I'm a dollar short for coconut shrimp night down at the Sizzler. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Helen Russell for joining us. You'll find her book, How to Be Sad, wherever books are sold. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2021 and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by Taylor Stevens with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. 
After you listen, check out our show notes page written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. Brooke and Joe also collaborate on a guide to the show and with lots of extras we couldn't include on today's podcast. Heck, they'll also throw in some life money lessons from Joe and it's all free. It's called The Stacker and you'll find it at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. She also is our social media coordinator, so say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. For a URL that'll take you right to our Facebook group, by the way, type stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and the people responsible for this show have been sacked. Welcome to the after show, you know, coming up the day after Thanksgiving in America, we always do our board game episode. We're actually planning the one for this year, but oh gee, I've been playing a couple board games lately that are not easy, but I thought that I'd do a quick, uh, quick review on, cause these are, these are economic games and I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this show like, uh, like seeing how businesses work and how economics work. And and I generally like games that don't really teach me, but give me more of an introduction to the topic so that later on, as I'm trying to dig in, that there's a bigger entry. And I'm going to start with this game called Brass. Brass Lancashire, which is by a uh, gentleman named Martin Wallace, is the designer. This game, OG, is about the Industrial Revolution in England You are an entrepreneur and you're setting up cotton mills around England and you are, this is the age of canals. So you're setting up canals to get your cotton to ports and you're shipping off the cotton. You're also setting up your own shipping lines if possible. Those are big points, but very difficult to do. You're also going to need coal. You're going to need iron. So you need the resources to make things go. And so that's the basis of the game. This is a very very difficult game to learn. So if you're thinking that, uh, you know, for people to think that risk is complicated, this game is even more complicated. What's wild about it though, is once you know the rules, once you understand how it works, it is a short ish game. We played it last night. It took, uh, my friends, John and Troy and I about 90 minutes to play this really kind of heavy simulation about the, about that age. But I'll tell you what's cool about the game. The hook is that halfway through the game, You finish going through this deck of cards and setting your thing up. And then the game simulates the changing of the era. Stevenson's rocket comes in, which is, of course, the early train. And now trains are here. So they're not using canals like they had previously. You take down all of your canals. You have to take down all of your level one things, meaning the very basic, uh, very basic cut mills, the, the, the very basic shipping yards, uh, a basic mines. And if they're basic, they're out of the game. They're obsolete. And so you take all that stuff off the board. You take all of the connectors off the board and you start again, but with trains and trains more expensive to set up, but much easier to get around. And and I love this. I love the fact that this game shows this, this kind of changing of the times, right? Partway through it. And uh, really, really, really fun. I took uh took second out of three last night. But if you're into 
economic simulation games, brass is one. And another one that's equally as difficult. And this, and, and this was going to sound kind of funny at first, but man, I never thought I'd have as much fun doing this as I could. And I am going to not say this right because it looks like it's a pret a porter and somebody is, is screaming at their device right now, but it's P R E T dash a dot port P O R T E R. Uh, pret a porte, maybe pret, pret a porte. I don't know. But what this is, OG, this is, this is the fashion industry in Europe and you run a fashion company. You get a bunch of designs for clothing lines and throughout the game, you're trying to show these different clothing lines in different places. And the clothing industry is expensive. And what I love is two things. Number one is you can spend a turn setting up a line of credit. And a line of credit will cost you very little, but it gives you these great resources and you have to pay it off after the upcoming fashion show. Or if you run out of money, you have to go to the bank and you have to take a loan. The interest rate on the loan is 40%. You get hammered. You get hammered on, oop, I ran out of so money. So just like uh, some slimy credit card company. Yeah, absolutely. Or time, elite, uh, getting your timeshare on credit. Right. From the timeshare company. From the time like, share you can com- borrow as much as hey, you want. Hey, this is great. Yeah. So if you accidentally run out of money, you can get it. But what I really like about it is there's different paths to victory. Number one is I can create clothing lines that focus on what I'm good at. I can also set up buildings and hire better workers. So I can hire better accountants who, who run the books better and bring in more money per, uh, because I'm pricing my stuff right. And because I'm controlling my overhead, or I can hire a bunch of models and, team up with modeling agencies and make my line look better so that it brings in far more prestige. Or I can do what I did the last time we played last week. I set up a bunch of retail stores. So now I'm selling the stuff. I'm not just designing the clothing. I've, I've got these retail stores and these uh, salespeople who are fantastic and I'm training my salespeople and they're selling my clothing. So it is for me an unlikely game type for me to, uh, for me to play. I don't, I don't, while I am a very snappy dresser OG, I've never known much about the, uh, about the fashion industry. Although there is a documentary I like called the September issue about Anna Wintour in Vogue and how they make that, which is great showing how, uh, how a business really operates in the fashion industry. It's a, it was a fantastic documentary. I don't know much about it, but man, is it fun? It is, it is a fun once again, very difficult game, but if you're into economics and you really want that feel of running a business, uh, pret a porte maybe, or Brass, Lancashire. Uh, there's also Brass, Birmingham. That version of Brass came out after Lancashire. I've never played it. I've heard it's also fantastic. So, This is the after show of Joe. This is nerd out after show. For your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like the course keeps changing right before your eyes. Whoa! And in order to maneuver it, you need an expert by your side. That's what Dell Technologies advisors do. They have the tech solutions you need to help you get out in front and stay ahead of the game. Woo! Call an advisor today at 877 Ask Dell and do more with modern devices in Windows 10 Pro.